Would you please join me in standing for our gospel lesson? Our gospel lesson comes from the Gospel of Luke, uh, chapter 10, verses 25 through 37, reading in Christ's name. And behold, the lawyer stood up and put him to, the, to, to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength, and with all of your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among robbers, who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down the road, and he saw, and he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place he saw him, he passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw, he had compassion. And he went to him, and he bound his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal and brought him to the inn and took care of him. And the next day he took him out to Denari, to Denarii uh, and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? And he said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, You go and do likewise. Here ends our gospel lesson. You may be seated. Have you ever watched a TV show or a movie and its portrayal of Christianity was so distorted and so twisted? Have you ever seen that on TV? I see it all the time and it makes me so angry. I remember watching this this one particular lawyer show on television. Uh, The lawyer really kind of had a general disdain for Christianity or anything faith-based. But the daughter of the lawyer actually became a Christian and there was some tension uh, between the two. Uh, In one particular episode, a colleague of that lawyer was shot and killed. And in this kind of intimate conversation, the the lawyer, the mother, asked the daughter, well, do you think that he's in heaven? And she goes, well, he was a good person, so he, he has to be. And I just wanted to take the glass that I had in my hand and just throw it through the TV, because that's karma. And it's amazing how on television, as as you look at the portrayal of Christianity, that they get the primary premise of Christianity wrong and how twisted and distorted the world sees Christianity. They almost see like this weighing of scales, which is karma. It's like, well, if my good outweighs my bad, I'll, I'll get into heaven. That is not the gospel and that is not what the Bible teaches. And so I kind of get irritated by that. And so today, as we look at this text, it's interesting that another lawyer, a professor of the law, a teacher of the law, a scribe, who probably most likely was a Pharisee, comes to Jesus and he asks him this question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? That's the key to the whole story, that question. Because everything from there pertains to salvation, even though sometimes we don't think it does. As we read the the parable of the Good Samaritan, sometimes we think like, wow, um, that's a lot of compassion. I I don't know that I can have that much compassion on people all the time. That's the point. Who can? The wonderful truth of this entire story, this entire historical event, as Jesus interacts with this lawyer, is to get us to the point where we understand that there's nothing that we can do to earn or to merit salvation. That's the key to the whole story and the parable that we are going to study today. Unfortunately, many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees had also misunderstood salvation, and their teaching only distorted the truth of what even in the Old Testament teaches, that we are saved by grace through faith. Romans chapter 4 reminds us of that and how Abraham, it was credited to him as righteousness, as salvation. And so the law was always given to remind us of our sin, to reveal God's holiness. And the law was given to an already redeemed people. The law is now our guide in how we worship God in the freedom of Christ Jesus. And so as we take a look at this today, 
May we never lose sight of the vital truth that we are saved by grace through faith alone. It's not grace through faith and. It's not by what I do and what I don't do. We are saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. Can anyone say amen? And that's the reality of our text today. Pray with me. Lord, I thank you for this text and this subtle reminder as Jesus, you, our Lord and Savior, interact with this lawyer. You bring us to the place where we have to acknowledge we cannot live that way. We cannot live by the law perfectly because that's your requirement. Lord, we thank you that you lived the perfect life that we could not. And you paid for the totality of our sin on the cross of Calvary. As we look at this text, Lord, open our hearts and minds for what you have prepared for us. May every word that proceeds from my mouth be from you and not from me. May it be in the power of your Holy Spirit according to your holy word and not from myself. Jesus, I pray that you would receive all the glory, honor, and praise. I pray this in Christ's precious name. And all of God's people said, And so the very first thing that we're going to take a look at in verses 25 through 28 is that Christ's wisdom leads people to the truth. Christ's wisdom leads people to the truth. Now, this lawyer stood up and he, and you can see his motives in verse 25. He wanted to test. He wanted to put Jesus to the test. If you look through in the chronological um, reality of all of the gospels kind of put together, there were already the Sadducees who went up and tried to trick him and Jesus put them pretty much to silence as well. And so here now was the Pharisees' turn to kind of come and see what they could do if they could kind of test Jesus. But again, the question that's asked by this lawyer, by this scribe, is really the key to our whole text. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? A very similar question was asked in John chapter 6. As Jesus had another very confrontational uh, conversation with some of the religious leaders, and they asked Jesus, and they asked the same question, what must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus' answer is very clear, believe. That's it. Believe. Believe in him whom the Father has sent. Jesus is that long-awaited promised Messiah, And as I said earlier, even in the book of Romans, we are saved by grace through faith alone. And this is the key to this. Because who can love the Lord your God with all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our strength? Who can do that all the time? No one. Some of you are really nice people. You are. And I love you all. But you're not that good. (laughs) Nor am I. It's just not, it's not, it's not true. As we look at the, at the Good Samaritan, and we will in, in a moment, can we do that all the time? Do we do that all the time? How many of us have driven by someone pulled alongside the road that had a flat tire? So I just don't have the time. Then you failed, right? James reminds us if we fail in one part of the law, the whole of the law is then brought against us. Before Christ, the Ten Commandments are our accusatory record of wrongs that the devil uses in God's divine court of justice. And we are guilty. Have you loved the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, and strength? Have you ever taken the Lord's name in vain? Have you ever cussed, swore, stubbed your toe? Do you always keep the Sabbath day to keep it holy? Are we in church every Sunday? Do we honor the word of God? On and on and on and on. All of us break the Ten Commandments on a daily basis, and Jesus, in his grace and mercy and his incredible wisdom, is trying to get this lawyer to see this, this person who's supposed to be an expert at the law. But unfortunately, the distortion of the Pharisees and Sadducees believe if you live like this, if if your good outweighs your bad, they started to really, literally teach karma. And it's never been that way, ever. And it's so interesting that as these people were supposed to be experts at the law and they were supposed to be, you know, these professors of the law, how they got it wrong. And if you look at the text right before this, where Jesus basically says, I think he, I, I, I believe it's almost a prophetic word where he says, Lord, thank you that you have hidden this from the wise and the learned, which you have revealed it to the children. He's not talking just about small kids. But there's this aspect of faith like a child where we say, okay, Abba Father, okay, Daddy Father, 
We are saved by grace through faith alone. We can understand this incredible truth as we study Christ's atoning sacrifice that through his life, death, and resurrection, he provided everything for salvation because there's nothing that we can do. Ephesians chapter two is, is our text on that. We are saved by grace through faith alone as a gift, not from works, not from what you do or you don't do. We are saved by grace through faith alone and what Christ has done. But as Jesus teaches this man, as he teaches us this morning, he does so by asking questions. And so the question I, I would ask to you as I ask all my confirmation students, how are we saved? Even though I've already answered the question for you, how are we saved? Romans says that now whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable. Wow. Wow. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified. Can I tell you what that word no means in the Greek? It means no, <laughs> no one. No human being will be justified in his sight through the law because through the law comes knowledge. We are saved by grace through faith alone. Before Christ, the law, the Ten Commandments are our accusatory record of wrongs. After Christ, in Christ, as a new creation in Christ Jesus, as our hearts have been changed and the Holy Spirit indwells the believer. The Ten Commandments are now ten ways in which we worship God in the freedom, the declaration of not guilty. We're not innocent. We just been, have been declared not guilty because of what Christ has done. Hallelujah and Amen. The freedom of Christ is profound. In that same conversation, Jesus says that everyone who sins is a slave to sin. But when the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. So does everyone sin? Uh-huh. Right? Maybe even on the way here. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, that you have sent your one and only Son and that you have provided a salvation that is inexhaustible and is graciously given to you and to I as a gift because of what Christ has done. The next thing we see in our text is that many try to justify their own complacency by distorting God's word. I see this all the time, and I'm telling you, it gets me so angry. Um, there's days, I, I don't... I, mean, just, I hope this doesn't sound arrogant. I don't mean it that way. And I don't mean to say that I'm the only one who has it right. I know a lot of pastors that are, that are smarter, more learned, and, and quite frankly, just better preachers, better teachers of, of the word than I am. And I've met those, I've studied under them in seminary, and many of those men, I aspire to, to have the knowledge that they have. But it's amazing on how many people who are actually on the radio and on the TV absolutely distort the gospel of Christ. It's extraordinary, I think that we value charisma over the truth, and I wish that wasn't the case. I think we see that in politics, don't we? But he, the lawyer, desiring to justify himself, there it is. Again, it's about our hearts. This is a heart issue. It's a motive issue. What must I do to, to inherit eternal life? Believe. Who is my neighbor, he asks. I think he's starting to realize that he can't do this. He's starting to realize that you, you can't love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, strength, and soul. That you can't love your neighbor as yourself all the time. The lawyer is still looking at this from an earthly perspective, a human perspective, and God and Jesus wants us to see from an eternal perspective. We are dead in our trespasses and sins. I've asked this before, and I know you all know the answer. What can a dead person do to save himself? The answer is Nothing. So if we can do nothing for salvation, aren't we totally and entirely dependent upon God's grace and mercy? And the answer is yes, we are. And that brings a humility. That brings a sorrow. That brings a true sense that you are totally and entirely dependent upon God's grace and mercy. And we are, and we always will be to the day we meet him face to face. Amen? Amen. We will. But he seeks to justify the teaching of the scribes and the Pharisees and this works righteousness that if, if you do this, you will live. If you do this, you'll have eternal life. As Jesus says it back to the Pharisee and the scribe, 
I think he thought it's like, okay, if you love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and strength, and you love your neighbor as yourself, okay, if you do all of that, you'll be saved. And the lawyer's like, I can't. I hope that's what he was thinking. That's what he should have been thinking. But salvation, even in the Old Testament, as I said, that we are saved by grace through faith. And as I said, as Romans chapter three, not one person will be justified in the sight of God by works of the law. Turn the corner in chapter four, for if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God because none of us are perfect. Only Jesus lived the perfect, sinless life. Verse three in Romans chapter four, for what does scripture say? Abraham believed God, there it was. He believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness, meaning God gave him what he needed to be saved. Salvation has and always will be grace through faith in Jesus, the promised Messiah even in the Old Testament. And Jesus wanted this lawyer to see that. And so as he tried to justify himself, we kind of come to our final point in that a tree is known by its fruit. A good tree can't bear bad fruit and a bad tree can't bear good fruit. And so Jesus replied by telling him the story of the Good Samaritan. It's interesting that he started off with two holy men that would be very revered in Jerusalem and in Israel, a priest and a Levite, which in a sense is one and the same. Instead of seeing and and having compassion on this man, they actually crossed to the other side of the road and went around it. And what Jesus is trying to say is that you, through your distortion of God's word, have put burdens on the people and you are literally ignoring those who need your help because you don't understand the gospel. You don't understand the truth that we are saved by grace through faith, even in the Old Testament. Now, Jesus uses a kind of a controversial figure. He, and I can just hear all of the gasps in the room as in verse 33, he goes, but a Samaritan. Everybody probably went, because oh, those were some of the most hated people by the people of Israel. It's a long story, but it really had to do with a bigotry that existed not purely from a racial standpoint, but just from a regional standpoint. It has to do with the Northern and Southern Kingdom in the Old Testament. But just for now, let's just kind of understand that Samaritans don't like Israelis and Israelis don't like Samaritans. There's a a great deal of hatred. Maybe that's kind of like North Dakota State and South Dakota State, right? (laughs) A little bit of angst there. So as as they're shocked in the Samaritan, all of a sudden the picture of this is the most unlikely person actually did what the Lord wanted him to do. Who was the most unlikely person to offer salvation or to provide salvation? And was he standing right in front of the lawyer? He was. How in the world could God become fully human and do everything required to provide salvation? Would anyone would have ever guessed that? There, sure, there are prophecies about this. Isaiah chapter 52 and 53. Psalm 22. Isaiah chapter 7 and chapter, chapter 9. Behold, a virgin will conceive, and you will call his name Emmanuel, which means God is with us. On and on and on, all through the Old Testament, God gave pieces of the puzzle that it would be God himself. He even did that to Abraham. In chapter 22 of Genesis, it was very clearly revealed to Abraham that God would be the one to provide the sacrifice, not any human being, because no human being can offer a sacrifice that will yield salvation and eternal life. Jesus born fully human without that original sin nature by the Virgin Mary as he was conceived by the Holy Spirit, took on human flesh, was made like us in every respect, it says in the, by the writer of Hebrews. He lived a sinless, perfect life because we can't. He paid for the totality of our sin on the cross of Calvary. And as he rose from the dead, Not only did he make the perfect sacrifice because he was fully human, but he made that perfect sacrifice eternally inexhaustible because he's also God. It could only be Jesus. 
So who is the Good Samaritan in the story? Or maybe I should ask this, who's the greatest Good Samaritan of all time? Who always is gracious and merciful? Who always takes care of those who are spiritually broken, dead, and hurting on the side of the road? Who is it that's a refuge and a strong tower for those who are in need? It's the ultimate Sunday school answer. It's Jesus. Jesus is the Good Samaritan who willingly left heaven, gave up everything. He became nothing so that you and I could have everything in him, the promise of eternal life. And so hopefully this lawyer came to his senses and he's like, I can't do that. I don't have the right heart to do that. I don't have the ability to keep the law that perfectly. I really hope that's what the lawyer came to the conclusion of, because that's the conclusion that all of us need to. Who is able to be that gracious, the graciousness that's displayed in, in the Good Samaritan, who can be that gracious 24-7? Look at your spouse and say, not you, no. <laughs> Do you understand? No one can be that gracious, no one except God. Jesus is the Good Samaritan who has provided salvation for any and all who place their trust in him because scripture says everyone, and can I tell you what the word everyone means in the Greek? Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. We are saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. May we never, ever lose sight of this important Christian truth. It is the core, the foundation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, I thank you for this text. And even though <laughs> the world thinks they understand you and they think, they think they understand Christianity, most people don't. Thank you for this wonderful story to remind us that no one can live the law perfectly. That Jesus, you came and did what we could not. May we never lose sight of that. But in the midst of our salvation, as we worship a holy and righteous God who has won the victory through Christ Jesus, may we use the Ten Commandments properly in the freedom of Christ. May they always be ways in which we worship the great triune God of creation who has saved us by the Father's will according to Christ's salvation in the power of the Holy Spirit. May we always be grateful. May we always humble ourselves and become more dependent upon the power of the Holy Spirit to bring us to this reality because you are everything. You are our refuge, our strong tower. You are the source of our salvation. And we thank you and we praise you. I pray all these things in Christ's precious name and all of God's people said.